Good morning. Do you guys know what Romans 8.28 says? Think so? Think so. I mean, if you hear it and you start saying it, you know, the church is like, oh, yeah, I know that one. For God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. That's a verse that's used in the wrong context a lot of times. It can be used in very bad places, you know. Tragedies happen, things happen, and then, you know, someone comes alongside and says, man, God causes all things to work together for good. And you're like, thanks so much. But I want to I want to dwell a little bit on that. Do you guys know who? Um, oh, no. Giannis is. Have you ever heard that name? Giannis? Help me with his last name. Anikupo. And he uh, he plays for the Milwaukee Bucks. And they were eliminated from the playoffs. And the, reporters, and the reporters are always the best because, you know, they just played like a million games through the season and they get to the very end and they get throttled. Like this team was supposed to do so good and they just get smashed. And the, these beautiful reporters that ask the best questions, he goes, so do, would you consider this season a failure? And, and you could tell like instantly, and he, they also call him the Greek freak. So he's got a little bit of an accent. It's beautiful. And he goes, are you kidding me? You're going to call this a failure? It's not a failure. It's absolutely not a failure. Look at all we accomplished. Look at all we did. Look at how far we made it. This wasn't a failure. We just didn't get the goal that we wanted. And I mean, and if you haven't seen this speech, and he goes right off the flight, and it is awesome. He's like, no, our team didn't perform like we should at this exact moment. But to say this whole year was a failure, absolutely not. It's a ridiculous question. I was reading through the scriptures and we, we, as a church, we read through this sometimes. In 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul, where Paul sets up, where Paul talks about the Lord's Supper. He says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let each person examine themselves. Then, and so eat the bread and the drink of the cup. For everyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Wherever you've been this week, wherever you were last week, if you had a great week, you were remembering Jesus, you did your daily reading in this weird book called Amos that you've never heard of before, or you had an awful week. You've messed up the worst you've ever messed up. You ignored, the Holy Spirit made promptings and you were like, not today, Spirit, not today. Whatever that, whatever that week was, 
what we're going to do right now is we're going to examine ourselves. We're going to bring it all to the foot of the cross. We're going to go, okay, Lord, I see this. You see this. I'm just laying it at your feet. As I remember your body and I remember your blood that was shed for me. That's what we're doing right now. But let's not stay there like we just say. Like we just say, oh, praise the name of the Lord Most High. Praise the one who reigns forever. So accept the forgiveness as you remember what Jesus has done for you. But man, I do encourage you, as the scripture says, spend some time discerning. Spend some time thinking about it. Spend some time examining your own life, your own heart, where you're at. Bring it all before Jesus this morning. And don't let those failures, those things that hold us back, they're only terrible if we just stay there. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, pray that you be with each one of us this morning as we examine ourselves, as we spend some time with you, as we think about where we've been, where we are, Lord. And God, I pray that our actions and our words would praise you in this time of in communion, God, that we spend together would be the starting point for our week, for the month, for the year, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's close our time in communion with prayer. Father in heaven, God, we are thankful for this time. We're thankful this, for this time to examine ourselves, God, to think about what you've done for us. God, I pray for the time that we spend in the word this morning. God, I pray for our hearts to be open to you and your calling and where you are calling us, God. In Jesus' name we pray.
children, you are dismissed to junior church. Oh, Elijah's down, but he's up. A um, couple things uh, this morning, and I don't know if they're, I think they're putting communion back. But does everybody have one of these? Everybody have one of these? You really need one of these because not only is there just important information about what's going on in the church, but there is a handout there this morning, and we need your feedback. Each and every one of you, we need your feedback. And so here's the deal. If you're like, no, I don't do paper, that's fine. You're going to get a text message if you're a member here and you're on the daily reading. Um, you're going to get a text message about this. But um, we have received the funds from the sale for the property next door. So what we're going to be doing is we are, we've got some things in here that we want to accomplish, some things that the leadership team has put together, and um, things that we need to do here at the building, maybe some enhancements, and then saving up for the future and whatnot in that area. But we want your input. And so please, 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 you'll see there's th that there's three options. Some of you guys are like, look, I trust you guys. Just let me know what's going on. I don't have an opinion. Mark option one. Option two is for if you see something in there and you're like, oh, 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 no, nope, I like all that, but I want to, I want a couple more things. Can you, can you guys think about this and can we discuss this? And option three is those are terrible ideas. I've got better ideas. And then you put them down at option three. Maybe you do. I hope you do. Here's the deal. We need each and every one of you, please. We're opening this for two weeks. It'll be open this week and next week. And then on May 21st, we're going to be sharing some of these results and some of the plans of what we'd like to do with some of the sales from next door. But also, also we're going to be talking about the leadership, um, who's in the leadership team, and kind of some of the things that are coming before August when uh, Bob retires from Tyler Street. So some of those things. So that's what I have for us this morning. Please, 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 please fill this out. Put it in the offering box. If you're like, nope, I don't want to do that, don't worry. You'll get a text message about it. Please don't fill out both. Easy enough, right? Okay, now I'll turn it over to Bob. Thank you, church. Thank you. All right, good morning. We're ready to go, I think, huh? Oops, he already changed it for me. Well, good, 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 good. My lovely wife and uh, Michael and I just got back uh, Friday night from Pepperdine, had a great, great time there, uh, got to uh, renew friendships with a lot of people, got to hear just a lot of good, encouraging um, things, but like they say, it's always good to be home, it's always good to be home. We're um, continuing our series on diving in. Now... <clears throat> If we took this picture and zoomed back, you know, like came like came way way up, you'd you'd see some things that are real important to see in this series. So if we brought that camera way up, one of the things that you'd see on this side of the pool is that you'd see your Father in heaven. And you'd see Jesus, your Savior, in the pool, inviting you to come in. And, and, and then what you'd see is on the back here, you'd see the Holy Spirit whispering to you, it's okay. You can go. You can jump in. It's going to be all right. Now, we, we need to mention, again, because it's really important, jumping into the pool is not the end goal. The, this series, and it's not to say, oh, jump in and then everything is good. I mean, you understand, of course, that getting into the pool is just the beginning. You get that, right? Because this is pretty important. Because the deal is, once you're in, you're going to find out that it's really, really good. You're going to really like being in there. In fact, you're going to like it so much, you're just going to want to kind of swim around, float around, and just enjoy 
being in the pool. In fact, you're going to like it so much, you're going to say, you know what, I, I think I'm going to become a swim instructor. I, I, I might even decide to be a lifeguard. I like being in the pool, and I like being around this so much. I'm going to teach others how to swim. I want to be a lifeguard. I'm, you might like it so much, you might decide, you know what I want to do? I want to go and be, I want to become a pool builder. I just want to build pools all over the place so that people can enjoy and experience what I've enjoyed and experienced. I mean, you know, after so much time in the pool and after deciding you want to become a, a, either a swim instructor or a lifeguard or a pool builder, you might say, you know what I want to do? I want to go see what it's like diving into rivers and lakes and oceans. And I just want to experience, I always want to be a part of what God is doing all over the place. Now, is that too much metaphor? If it's too much metaphor, let me just say plainly then. You might like being all in for Jesus so much that you just want to look for other opportunities to bring others in to help them enjoy what you're enjoying. And you might, you might wonder, why did I wait this long? to enjoy and experience these things that God has for us. Another very, very, very important thing about this series of diving in. This series is not about repenting of sin and calling you back to God. That's an incredibly important message that the church can never forget. Repenting of sin and calling ourselves or others back to God. It's always a relevant message. The series on diving in is not about that, though. If the series was about that, those little feet would be turned the other direction, walking away from the pool. Does that make sense? So we're, we're not ignoring that, that there is a need to do that. That's just not what this series is calling us to. This series is, is calling us to, we're right there. You've got the Father and the Son inviting us in. You've got the Holy Spirit urging us to take that step to be a little bit closer. This series is about jumping in to God, towards God. This series is about how we address those fears and concerns about doing that. Jordan helped us understand from the very first one, all Peter needed, you remember? All Peter needed was, Peter said, Lord, command me. That was all Peter needed. You remember what Gideon needed? All Gideon needed was to know that he could trust God. So he had all these neat little fleece things. But that was all Gideon needed to know. All the woman last week, Jordan did a terrific job with the woman with the flour and oil. All she needed to know was that she could be generous without worrying about if she was going to have enough. See, that was all she needed to jump in. See, So with this series, we hope that with one of these lessons, that we can reach what you need to dive in to what God has for you. Because it's not one size fits all. You know, our individual brokenness and the trauma that we've experienced over our life and then all of a sudden, you know, somebody says, just trust God. And there's things that we have to get over before we can actually do that. So this morning, we're going to ask Amos. 
the book of Amos, the Old Testament. He's one of the minor prophets, and that doesn't mean that he's less important. It just means that his book is smaller, okay? So we're going to look at Amos, and we're going to see what, hopefully we'll see what Amos can do to help us get over whatever it is to finally dive in. Now, do you remember two weeks ago, we, we brought the lesson about Gideon. And do you remember the times that Gideon lived in? Do you remember we just did a little bit of a foundation for that? Do you remember the, the problem was that everyone was just deciding for themselves what was right and what was wrong? You know, a lot like today, you know. Oh, no, you can't tell me you're not my boss. You know, I decide what's... But that's how it was in Gideon's day. And do you remember... Do you remember at least four times how they tried to describe the problem? Maybe you'll remember this. It says, in those days, there was no king of Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So it, it was kind of like they were blaming the, the moral decay of the times, that they were blaming it well, because there was no king. There was nobody in charge. There was nobody to make the rules and enforce the rules. I mean, it's almost like that's what it sounds like, right? The, the reason everyone did was right in his own eyes because there was no king. So that was Gideon. We're going to Amos. Amos comes 400 years later. 400 years later. And a minimum, depending on how you count them, a minimum of 25 kings later. So, you have 25 kings, you have 400 years. I mean, this ought to look like heaven, right? Wrong. Things are worse. Things are worse. So if you were sitting down, uh, you know, at Paws or Starbucks or Pete's, and you're able to talk with Amos, and you're saying, well, I thought the problem was that there was no king. And Amos would just start laughing. Amos would tell you, hey, look, you're not going to change the hearts of people just by making rules and making somebody the boss. Until, until we're ready to submit to the creator of the universe, to Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth. I don't care how many kings and how long you give it. It just won't work. Now, we're not going to go over Amos's life as, as if it was some historical um, timeline. You know, this is what we're not going to do. Well, here's... Amos's introduction, and, and here's the oracles. We're not going to do that. The reason we're not going to do that is because that's not how God intended us to look. Not just at the book of Amos, but the whole... I mean, it's not just a, a historical account. It is that, but that's not how it's intended to be read at, at all. A historical timeline doesn't communicate God's purposes for having Amos as a part of the biblical story. And it's just real important we understand that. Whether we're reading uh, Amos or, or Micah or Nehemiah, I mean, any of these, there's a purpose more than just leaving a historical record of what happened. Amos and the other Old Testament stories deal with real people and real situations of life under all kinds of circumstances. And all of those teach us how we ought to live or how we ought not to live. And remember we touched on this, um, I think with Gideon. You know, Paul reminds Christian people, now these things happen, and he's talked about some of the events of Israel's being uh, led out of um, uh, uh, Egyptian bondage, and some of the other historical events. And Paul tells us, now these things happened to them as an example, that, and they were written for our instruction. See, and you really need to underline that in your Bible. These things, yes, it's a historical event. 
It's an actual event. But they were written for our instructions upon whom the end of the ages have come. So we'll try to look at Amos as a story of a man who decided to dive in when God called him. And, and by the way, you know, if you're just trying to connect some different dots, you're going to notice real, real, real soon that when God called Amos, Amos's response was quite a bit different than when God called Jonah. Remember? Yeah. Yeah, Jonah couldn't get further away from what God wanted him to do. You're, you, we're going to find a different response here in the life of Amos. So l let's start here. This is Amos chapter 1, verse 1. And he says, The words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa, which he saw in visions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, son, um, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So here we have this guy, Amos, and it sounds like all he is is just a, a rancher. He's a sheep herder. He has a, he has a side hustle also, and, and he'll tell us about that in, in a few minutes. And then he's also going to tell us what he's not, which is real, real important. But he's a rancher. He's a, he's a farmer. He's just a hardworking guy. I mean, he's not going to be a lot different than most of us in this room. I mean, if he was contemporary, maybe he'd work for the state. Maybe, you know, maybe he'd work for a, a utility company. Uh, maybe he'd be in construction. I mean, there'd be all, but he would just be doing, this would be what occupied most of his time. But the one thing about Amos, even though he was very normal in that regard, is that Amos was able to see firsthand all of the negative effects of the world that had abandoned and rejected the God of heaven. Amos was able to see firsthand the effects of what happens when you break your contract with God. God had made a contract with Israel, and Israel had promised to keep it. Another thing you need to know about Amos. Then Amos replied to Amaziah, Look, I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I'm a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. This is really important, you guys. When, when we're trying to challenge and encourage one another to dive in, it's nice to know there's someone like Amos. Amos says, look, guys, I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I'm a rancher and a farmer. See? Now, if, if we're going to bring that up to today, what Amos is saying is that, look, I'm not a preacher, and I'm not a preacher's kid. See? I'm just a farmer and a rancher. You're probably not going to see me preaching Sunday morning. You're probably not going to see me teaching a Sunday school class. But what you will see is men, like men and women, before and after Amos, Amos was faithful. He was faithful to God, and he was faithful to the people of God. So you're with me, right? We're, we're still together. We're talking about this. We're not talking about... And remember that during those times, there was what was called the school of the prophets. You remember that? Reading, you know, that bizarre. There was a school of prophets. And these were just um, aspiring <laughs> young men. 
And so they would learn of the covenant that God had made with Israel. And they would learn what Israel had promised to do. And these guys were schooled in this. And so when they went out and preached, they could say, I'm not a prophet, but, but I went to the school of the prophets. Amos doesn't say that. Amos is just one of us. Okay? The thing about being all in, the thing about diving in, it's all about just a willingness to be or a willingness to do whatever God calls us to. See, that makes sense. I mean, you, you, you know, we don't come out of the baptistry uh, raised to walk in newness of life and stay in that level of maturity forever. We're, we're growing, we're becoming, and in that process, you know, one of the things that Peter says, I'm sorry, that Paul tells Timothy is that, you know, we just need to keep growing and maturing so that when God needs a job done, he can say, oh, Brad, you're the perfect one. You know, you've equipped yourself. You've prepared yourself. Oh, Smee, you're the perfect one. See, to, for this job, you've, we've prepared ourselves for it. So th that's the whole idea of diving in. So l look at how this applies to Amos. This is what Amos is speaking now. He said, look, the Lord took me from following the flock, and, and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people of Israel. So now, hear the word of the Lord. Now, you guys are saying, you shall not prophesy against Israel, nor shall you prophesy against the house of Isaac. Amos says, well, now that's what you guys say, but here's what happened. I'm working on the ranch, I'm tending the fig trees, and God says, Amos, I need you to go do this. Now, I'm not a prophet, I'm not a son of a prophet, but the Lord called me, so now... Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. God was able to use what he had. Amos, saying, Amos is saying, Here, here's what I used to do, and here's what God calls me to do, and the rest, as they say, is, is the book of Amos. So Amos prophesies against all of Israel's neighbors, which I'm sure made Israel pretty happy. You know, he, I mean all of them, the nation. You put Israel in the middle, all the nations around. Amos says, you guys are toast. And Israel's going, yes, get them, God. But a lot changes when all of a sudden that um, Amos turns to his own people. And Amos turns and tells his people how they've broken their agreement with God. And he uses the same format with the other nations. There's three things I have against you. Actually, there's four. And then he just lists them off. He lists them off. But, but really, if you, want to know what, if you want to know what Amos is getting at, we're going to go to Micah. Because Micah... He just condenses this thing. This is what Micah says. He's told you, oh man, God, God has told you, mortal one, what's good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. So Amos and Micah and the other prophets, they're, they're saying, look, you can't say you don't know. You can't say, well, how did we know we weren't supposed to um, hang out with temple prostitutes? How do we know? How did we know we weren't supposed to not cheat people? Oh, God has told you, man, what is good and, and what the Lord requires is but to do justice and to love kindness and, and to walk humbly with your God. You see, in this case, Micah is the prosecuting attorney. And these are the char charges brought against Israel. And right out of the gate, Micah says, look, don't use the I didn't know line on God. Don't use that. Uh, in, in fact, 
In, in fact, in Amos, in chapter 3 and verse 7, this is one of Amos's lines. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. So you go, away, go back as far as you want. Go back to Moses or go back to Samuel. Go back to those early prophets all the way through. And what it is is God revealing to his people what he's going to do, what he wants to do, what he hopes he doesn't have to do. They're warned repeatedly, repeatedly, so much so that, look, um, this is what Amos is going to remind the people. This is what God is saying. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there was still three months until the harvest. Then I would send rain in one city, but on another I would net I would not send rain. One part would be rained on, while the part not rain would dry up. So the people of two or three cities would stagger to one city to drink water, but would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. And he goes on. I struck you with scorching wind and mildew. The caterpillar was devouring your gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees. And yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent a plague among you as in Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword along with your captured horses. And I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a log snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. So it's like through the prophets and through these natural um, disasters that God would bring about, it was a call to come back, come back, come back. And the repeating line is, yet you have not returned to me declares the Lord. They've been warned repeatedly. Now remember, we said that this series isn't about a, a call to repentance and, and, and to come back to God. It's about what God is telling Amos to do. He's a rancher. He's a farmer. This is what he has to tell the people. And here's, here's where you just smile at the beauty of the word of God. It's not like Amos lives in some alternative universe. Here, here's what he says. People hate this kind of talk. Raw truth is never popular. We agree, Amos. Nobody likes to hear Nobody likes to hear where we've failed. Nobody likes to hear about how we've broke our word, our agreement, our covenant. So Amos realizes that, that he's swimming upstream here. Amos realizes with what God has called him to do, he's not going to have people patting him on his pointy little head saying, Good sermon, Amos. We really needed that. People hate this kind of talk. Raw truth is never popular. So he has some suggestions. He says, seek good and not evil and live. You talk about God, the God of the angel armies, being your best friend. Well, live like it and maybe it'll happen. Hate evil, love good, then work it out in the public square. Live it out. And, and, and maybe God, the God of the angel armies, will notice your remnant and be gracious. So Amos is like, I mean, he's, he's trying to balance it, right? He's trying to balance it. Nobody likes your bad news. Well, well maybe we, what we ought to do is just start changing the way we live. Now, of course, when you get to chapter 9, God through Amos, like God through everyone always does, gives Israel hope. And so Amos is, is able to give the people some hope. But what I want us to do now is I want us to leave Amos and his story 
and his diving in. And it's not because we're more important than Amos in his story. But it's because God wants us to read and to process and to apply these things in our own life. It's not so much the calling out of sin and breaking faith with God, but it's Amos's willingness to go out of his comfort zone, to get off the farm, off the ranch, and go to... He, see, he lives in the southern part of Judah, and God calls him to go to the northern part of Israel. So when we say that Amos, God calls Amos to leave his comfort zone, we, we mean literally and not just figuratively. So that's what we want to do. But I want to give you an illustration first. Smee so and I used to raise bees. Any, do we have any beekeepers here? Oh, too bad. I loved keeping bees and tending bees. I loved harvesting honey. And you know, you can buy frames that already have um, combs in them. They're plastic. And then you can leave some of your frames open and the, the bees will make their own wax and then they'll fill it up. And that's the honeycomb. And when we're harvesting our honey, I would love to get some of the raw honeycomb and I, I wouldn't extract the honey from it. You know, we would just take big chunks of honeycomb and then we would cut it up. We'd put it in jars or we'd put it on a plate. And, and what you could do, what I love to do is I just cut a chunk I just would cut a chunk of honeycomb, I pop it in my mouth, and I just chew and chew and chew and chew and chew. I chew till there was no more honey, and then I just spit out the wax. See? I mean, there was good stuff in there. But what I had to do, put pop it in there, chew, 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 spit it out. That's what I want you to do with the book Amos. I just want you to cut a chunk of Amos off. I just want you to chew on it. And I want you just to take all of the sweetness out of it and then just spit the wax out. I don't know if there's going to be much wax in there, but that's just what I want you to do. It's what I'd like to do with Amos' story this morning. I want us to extract every bit of sweetness out of him and his story and see what there is for us. So let, let's, let's start with this. Um, are you shocked at the world you, you find yourself living in today? I mean, if you uh, aggressively or passively look at the news, look around, are you shocked at how bad things are? Yeah, right. Are you shocked at how bad things seem to be trending you, are you you're shocked about that? Yeah. Well, here's a question. Why are you shocked? I, I mean, why, why are you shocked? Haven't you read? Haven't you been warned? Don't you know what Jesus said? And, and, and you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed for these things have to take place. But it's not the end. Haven't you read? Haven't you been warned of Paul telling Timothy, but realize that in the last days, difficult times will come. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money. This was Paul writing then. The lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant. They'll be slanders. They'll be disobedient to parents. They'll be ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable. They'll be malicious gossips. They'll be without self-control. They'll be brutal. They'll be haters of good. And so I say, I ask you, are you shocked? And when you say yes, I say why? What should shock us is that things aren't worse. See, that's what should shock us. We should be shocked that things aren't worse. And you're saying, thanks for the encouragement, Bob. No, no, no. See, that's not the point. The point is, that if we were paying attention, we knew what to expect. We should have expected that the pressure of the world would press against us. 
that the pressure of the world would try to conform us to whoever they, they are in their thinking. See, we should, we should understand. So we, we should understand that what the world wants us to do, to be ashamed when we wear $10 Walmart shoes because everybody knows that $110 Nike shoes are better, even though they're both made in China. But see, you're made to feel, you know, you, you, you think that your self-esteem is going to be better if you have the $110 shoes. I'll tell, let me say something to younger people. Younger people. Us older people, we don't care what shoes you're wearing. We don't care. Michael Doherty's dad, John Doherty, wonderful man. You're going to get to meet him during uh, Mission Awareness Month. He, he was probably the least pretentious guy in the world, Michael, right? John, but John liked to run, keep in shape, but he wasn't a um, he, he wasn't a trendsetter. So John would run in whatever shoes he had. Sometimes the loafers, you know, sometimes those you know fancy dress. He just would run in them because the goal was to run. The goal wasn't to make a fashion statement. But see, we shouldn't be surprised that the world is pressing down on us to conform. To them, see. And, and all we have to do is just take a minute and say, well, if I become like that, I, I'm just part of the problem. See, I, I'm, I'm the problem. I, maybe I'll feel better about myself, but how long will that last? And the answer is not, not very long at all. I, I know those are probably some dumb illustrations, but I think you get the point. Because, see, now we extend it. We can say, are you happy with your community? Are you happy with, with the world around you? Are you happy with where you are in the plan of God? Are you excited about the future that you're passing? Listen, are you happy about the future you're passing on to your children and your grandchildren? Are you happy about that? In light of what we know is coming. Are you waiting for, are you wishing for someone to do something? Are you waiting for God to do something? Here's a thought. What if God's waiting for us to do something? I don't know, but... Seems like if, if we're being described as, as light and salt and blessing, it seems like that isn't an ingrown quality we're supposed to have. To bless and not curse, to let others see your good work so they glorify. I mean, it seems like that we're supposed to be part of the, of the solution. And, and remember, remember what Micah told the people of Israel. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. It's not like we're ignorant or devoid of an understanding of what God calls us to. It's just that we're at the edge of the pool there, people. And even though we know it's our Father in heaven and Jesus there and the Holy Spirit behind us, there are still these It's just easier to go back to being a farmer and a rancher and what it means just to, to, to dive in. And see, diving in is not just enjoying the benefits of the pool. See, that's what we learn. You know, we didn't know that when we first came to know Jesus. We didn't understand that when we first were baptized. But pretty soon, we realized that we've been comforted so that we can comfort others. We've been blessed so that we can bless others. We've been forgiven so that we can forgive others. We've been shown the light so that we can be the light. Being light, being salt, being the person standing in the gap, giving a glass of cold water to someone thirsty, giving clothes to the naked, food to the hungry, companionship to those in prison. It's learning to live 
generously. It's offering to babysit for a family with young children so they can spend time alone. It's, it's volunteering to help at VBS. Now, that's a shameless plug. <laughs> but please, talk to Beth afterwards. That's what these things are. It's an arm around the shoulder of someone who's struggling. It's, but you get the picture. You don't have to be a prophet or the son of a prophet. You don't have to be a preacher or the son of a preacher. You just have to be willing that when God says, come here, here's where I want you. That's what we'll do. It's understanding this is always, and, and I'll be real honest with you guys, I, I don't like singing that song where it says, we are the hope of the world. That song convicts me. But this is what Paul said, so that the man of uh, multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known through the church. You see, there's not a plan B. You've heard that in regard to Jesus dying for you and me. God didn't have a plan B. Jesus was going to die. When that good news was going to get out to the world, God didn't have a plan D. It was going to be you and me. Not so much as prophets and the sons of prophets, preachers, but just as people that have been recipients of the good news. It's understanding Ephesians 4, therefore I, prisoner of the Lord, Paul speaking, the apostle Paul speaking to Christians, I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. See, that's ministry. All, all he's asking us to do is to let our, our talk and our walk uh, match up with, with what we've been given and what we've been called to. It's understanding it's understanding that the more in the pool, the merrier. That's the bottom line. I've got a very corny video to show you to, to help you understand that point. So I think everybody's going to help me do this right now. Here you go. 